right, hello everybody and welcome to the um, the third series in our Dickens Project Friends Faculty Fellowship program. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I just want to tell you a little bit about this program for those of you who, who haven't um, participated before or who haven't been here before. Um, this is an, a new program that the Dickens Project um, began this year, and its aim is to um, invite uh, faculty members who are doing research in various aspects of Victorian studies um, to come into the Dickens Project community and to um, just to talk to us about their research, to, to expand the world of the Dickens Project a, a bit beyond Dickens and to, to open us up to all of the different kinds of um, research and writers and areas that, that, um, that scholars are working on. So um, the way that the, the program is, is currently organized is that um, during each quarter of the school year, UC Santa Cruz, which is where the Dickens Project is based, is on the quarter system. We've invited one faculty member to um, give an initial talk about their research. So um, I was the I was the the um, guinea pig in the fall, and Grace Moore, who is here, was our fellow in the winter. Um, and now we are we are on to our, our spring fellow. Each fellow gives one initial talk about their research and the projects they're working on, and then chooses chooses a novel that is tied to their research. And the second two talks in, in the series are book discussions where, where anybody who's interested can read the book that they have chosen um, and come and just, just talk about it and, and learn about it and, and, and think about the different ways that people can, can talk about those books. And they're just really fun sessions. They're, um, they're informal, they're, um, they're really illuminating and quite wonderful. So um, our, our um, faculty fellow for this spring is Deanna Kreisel. Um, Deanna Kreisel is Associate Professor of English and Co-Director of Environmental Studies at the University of Mississippi. She's the author of Economic Woman, Demand, Gender, and Narrative Closure in Elliot and Hardy, as well as articles on Victorian literature and culture that have been published in, um, in really fantastic journals like PMLA, Representations, ELH, Novel, Mosaic, Victorian Studies, 19th Century Literature, and elsewhere. She's the co-editor, along with Devin Griffiths, of a special issue of Victorian Literature and Culture on Open Ecologies, as well as the volume After Darwin, Literature, Theory, and Criticism in the 21st Century, um, which came out just this past year from Cambridge University Press. She's currently working on a new book project on ecological mourning and utopia, and that's the project she's going to be um, talking about with us uh, over the course of the next um, the next three sessions. So, um, so, Deanna, I would like to turn things over to you, um, and and we're very excited to hear what you have to say. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Renee, and thank you to the Dickens Project um, for this opportunity. I'm so excited to talk to you about this work and to hear feedback from you, because as I'm going to explain, a lot of what I've been working on is more kind of public facing work. And I'm, I'm actually really interested in, in kind of interfacing between the sort of scholarly world and the, you know, the world of the informed public who's interested in these questions and issues. And, and a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today really is relevant uh, to the quote unquote real world outside the academy. Not that the academy isn't real, but, <laughs> but we tend to kind of make that distinction. So um, what I wanna do today is, I'm, let me pull up, um, I've got a PowerPoint thing that's gonna guide us through today's session. So it kind of has an overview of, what, of the various topics I'm gonna to be talking about. And so let me just pull it up here. Okay, great. Can everybody see that? Awesome. Okay, so um, the, the book project that I'm working on right now is tentatively entitled Ecological Grief and the Work of Utopia. So I'm just gonna move my little uh, thumbnails because they're covering up the slide so I can't see it. There we go, okay. <laughs> I need to be able to read my own slides. Um, ecological grief and the work of utopia. Uh, and it's going to be roughly half and half Victorian and kind of more contemporary stuff. So again, book projects, titles change as you continue to work on them, but this is the provisional title for now. And I think it's um, hopefully pretty descriptive. Um, okay, why? there we go. That and that advanced the slide. I'm just making sure everything's working the same way in your end. Okay. So what I want to do today, so the kind of overview for today's session, it, I'll start with a brief description of the project. 
And then I want to spend just a few minutes in breakout rooms and ask, pose a question to you about Utopia, just about five to seven minutes or so. And then we'll come back. And I'm going to actually read a paper, a uh, more or less formal paper about the history of Utopia, which will be about 30 minutes or so. Uh, then a more detailed breakdown of the book chapters and talking through a little bit about what each of the chapters will do in the book. And then we'll have some time for questions and answers. And then just a brief kind of explanation of what's going to happen uh, in the next two sessions. So um, to start with the description of the project overall. So basically this started because I'm, I've been very interested as I think a lot of people have been lately in the question of ecological mourning. So that question of, you know, how are we facing our future? How are we facing uh, the sort of anxieties that we have about climate change and what the future is going to look like as we move through these kind of changes that are happening to our planet and the ecosystem around us. But of course, since I'm a Victorianist, I realize this isn't a new thing that actually people have been thinking and writing about what we might call ecological mourning for a long time. Probably you could stretch it back as far as you wanted to. You could go all the way back to the ancient Greeks, I'm sure. But uh, I like to think it really kind of you know starts in the early Victorian period with the Romantics um, and and moving into the, the later 19th century. So. I sort of start with a history of ecological mourning or ecological grief, um, beginning with John Ruskin, uh, who I think is kind of a touchstone for this, who wrote a lot about the environment and lamented uh, environmental change and pollution and the changing sky around him. So there's a, he, he did write a lot about that. Um, but I also talk about other environmental, environmental writers, poets, novelists from the beginning of the 19th century. And then I so because I'm interested in pairing these two things, right? Not just the mourning piece, but also the utopia piece, right? So like the, the sadness and the hope, uh, I then talk about this, the sort of utopia craze of the late 19th century. And I'll be going into that in some more detail in the paper that I read, uh, which, and Morris's novel, News from Nowhere was part of that. That's the book that we're gonna be reading together. Uh, so that's kind of the first half, which is Vic you know, the Victorian half. Then I move into a discussion of more recent and present day responses to ecological change including literary responses. So I think about how our own style or the, or the way that we're approaching these questions of mourning are also a legacy of Victorian thinking and continuities between the way the Victorians framed these questions and, and we are thinking through them as well. And then I end with the discussion of uh, recent ecotopian thinking, right? So utopias that think about the environment uh, as a, or a kind of utopian version of the environment. Um, from scholarly treatises. So there's like for the full range of straight up kind of works of scholarship about this through to more popular kind of press books that are uh, sort of addressing a, a wider audience all the way to actual utopian living experiments. So like people who are actually trying to put these kinds of ideas into practice. So that's the overview of the project itself. Um, and as I said, what I wanna do uh, to start off with is to to divide up into, into breakout rooms um, just for a few minutes. Uh, I think we decided upon seven minutes. And uh, so you'll be in a breakout room with a few other people and I'm gonna be put into one randomly as well. And what I'd like us all to do in those rooms is to introduce ourselves, just say our names so we can kind of you know get to know each other a little bit. And then I'd like you to talk about what comes to mind when you hear the word utopia, right? So I imagine, any people who are attracted to this seminar and wanted to come to this particular seminar may already have some ideas about utopia um, or thought quite a lot about utopia. Maybe you haven't thought about it at all, but I kind of want to know what you're coming into the seminar. What are the kinds of ideas or preconceptions or notions you have? What words come to mind? And somebody says the word utopia to you, what do you immediately think of? So that's your little assignment. Um, for the breakout room. So we'll do about five to seven minutes with that and then we'll come back together again. And I'm not gonna ask people to share their responses right away. I'm actually gonna read my paper on the history of Utopia and we'll move through the rest of the discussion of the, the research project. And then at the end, I wanna uh, us to share because I wanna kind of do a little comparison of like what, what had been your initial thoughts and then did anything change like over the course of, of our discussion today. So. Um, I think Courtney's going to put us all into breakout rooms now, and I'll I'll just be I'll be in one of them randomly. So I don't know whose it'll be, but I'll I'll see some of you in in in, in the breakout rooms. So I hope that everybody got a chance to say a little bit about what their sort of 
ideas or conceptions, I don't want to say preconceptions, but conceptions of utopia are going into this seminar. Um, and what I, like I said, what I want to do um, toward the end is have a chance to revisit that those key terms or ideas or, or whatever it is you all talked about after we kind of move through this uh, discussion about utopia and see what's different or maybe what's new. Or, I mean, I've already just in my breakout room thought of a new thing about utopia, even though I've been thinking about this stuff for years. So I think that's really great. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is um, start by, so I asked you all to think about like what comes to mind when you say the word utopia. I already had some terms that I've gathered from talking to mostly my students, but lots of other co colleagues and scholars as well. So, uh, I, you know, I, I basically <laughs> like kind of buttonhole people every chance I get to say, what do you think utopia means? Because I'm just fascinated by this question of what people already are bringing to this, um, to this idea. So the words that I have heard most often, ideal, right? To say something is utopian is to say it's ideal or perfect. Perfect. <laughs> um, imaginary, which, you know, in other words, it's not really a thing that can exist. It has to be in uh, somehow in a work of imaginative literature or film or whatever. Unrealistic. So we're getting a little bit more pejorative here, unattainable. Um, and so I've sort of organized these words in order from what we might think of as kind of more positive sense of the word utopia through to not negative, but words that are maybe not as, you know, that utopian means something like impractical or unattainable, or even like, as we'll see in, in the paper I'm about to read, uh, politically problematic, right? There's ways in which utopia can be seen as um, inherently uh, courting or flirting with uh, ideas about close to fascism, right? So we'll talk more about that as well. Um, so this is the part where I'm going to read to you the pa a paper, and I'm going to try to be as animated as possible. I know it's not, uh, you know, it's a little bit difficult on Zoom to just sit and listen to somebody talk for 30 minutes, but uh, I've put some quotations on slides and whatnot so that um, to break it up a little bit. But um, uh, hopefully this is interesting enough that it will, it will, uh, the time will fly by. So this is a, an adaptation of a piece that I wrote for the Rutledge Companion to Politics and Literature. So the editor of that volume asked me to write a, a piece on utopia as part of this um, larger volume of, of essays considering connections and relationships between uh, political movements or politics in general and literature of any kind. So it's a very broad and big volume. So my contribution is on utopia. So I adapted this, I cut it down a little bit and, and added a little bit here and there. So but it's basically the, the piece that I wrote for that volume. So. Um, okay. At first blush, it seems fairly obvious what we mean by the term utopia, a theoretical ideal society or a literary work that describes such a society. Yet it's difficult to capture all the permutations of utopia in a single definition. Is it best understood as a genre, a mode, a style, a political project? Contributing to the difficulty of defining utopia is the fact that arguments over its proper role and function sometimes take place in the quote unquote real world outside of literature, in schemes of social reform, the planning of intentional communities and other acts of political practice. Utopianism also has a psychological valence and I'll be interested to see if anybody actually talked about this in their breakout rooms. Um, it often has a psychological valence. The term is often used to refer to a type of impulse need or drive that some believe is inherent in the human psyche? Is fantasizing about ideal worlds hardwired in the human brain? Or at the very least, is it a strongly internalized cultural imperative whose sheer pervasiveness requires an explanation? To complicate matters further, utopia is perhaps unique among literary genres in inspiring a robust theoretical conversation that often draws explicit connections between the literary and the political. Furthermore, for utopia, the question about how representation relates to practice is particularly fraught and raises a series of questions. To what extent do we need to consider the political uses of utopia and the existence of real world utopian experiments in order to understand and describe the form of the utopian novel. In other words, what is the connection between literary utopia and actual utopia? How do we account for parallel and divergent developments of utopia in different cultural contexts? 
in different languages and in different literary traditions? How do we do so without artificially separating the literary, the pragmatic, and the theoretical? And finally, after all these centuries, where is utopia today? So to begin at kind of the beginning, Thomas More coined the term utopia in his 1516 text of the same name, yet of course he invented neither the concept nor the genre. Western literary representations of ideal societies that predate utopia include Plato's Republic, Hesiod's Golden Age, the island of the Phaeacians and Homer's Odyssey, the medieval land of cocaine, and even the biblical Garden of Eden. More's utopia, however, uh, 1516, not only gave the genre and concept an enduring name, it also codified the generic elements that subsequent authors have mostly honored. An ideal society, a traveler narrator, a guide who explains the society's structure and rules, a return to the homeland, an audience waiting to hear the tale. So those are the elements of literary utopia. Not every single one adheres to them, but for the most part, most of them do. Both the ideal society and the genre itself are governed by a rigid set of rules. Perhaps the most important, the description of utopia contains a buried or not so buried critique of the traveler author reader's own country or society. Through comparison to an ideal social organization, the flaws of the author's culture are laid bare. In the case of Moore's text, these comparisons are more or less direct. The traveler in the case of Moore's um, text is called Raphael Hifflede, and he's given to pronouncements such as, quote, your sheep swallow up people. They lay waste and depopulate fields, dwellings, and towns. And that's his critique of, of course, um, the Britain of Thomas More's time and the enclosures. But as we'll see later in, this, in, in, the, in my essay, many subsequent utopias and dystopias have relied on satire to drive their critical points home. The island of utopia in More's text is located vaguely in the new world somewhere. Um, the character of Thomas More, who actually appears inside the text as a character himself, conveniently forgets to ask Hithlade, the traveler, quote, in what part of that new world utopia may be found, unquote. As Frederick Jameson points out, and he's a famous literary critic, but he's also um, a, one of the central theorists of utopia. Um, as Frederick Jameson points out, utopia as a genre is from its outset, quote, enabled by geographical exploration and the resultant travel narratives, unquote, that depict, quote, tribal societies and their well-nigh utopian dignity. Thus, from its very beginning, utopia was a genre and perhaps a political construct inseparable from colonialist and racist ideologies. The tradition among Moore's utopians, the um, inhabitants of utopia, is that their founder, um, Utopus, quote, who gave his name to the island by conquest, later, quote, raised its brutish and uncultivated inhabitants to such a level of civilization and humanity that they now outshine virtually all other nations. The suggestion is that even this process of civilization was made possible by the shipwreck of a group of Romans and Egyptians who brought with them skills and techniques, quote, developed for the improvement of life. Apparently, so basically, there's a, a, an island in the New World full of natives, uh, and, a, and they found this society, this utopian society, but they were really only able to do so, according to Moore, because um, some Romans and Egyptians were shipwrecked there and mixed with the natives. So um, apparently it was impossible for Moore to imagine a group of indigenous Americans developing a just and rational society on their own. The relationship between colonial conquest and utopian literature is fascinatingly complex. Moore's utopians practice colonization as a means of population control. When their own island becomes too crowded, they establish a colony on the mainland, quote, wherever the native population has redundant and untilled land, um, unquote, and forcibly conquer anyone who resists the implementation of their laws. The utopians, quote, view it as an entirely just cause for war when those who possess a territory leave it idle and unproductive, denying use and possession to others who, by the law of nature, ought to be fed by it, unquote. This is arguably the earliest articulation of the principle of terra nullius, the idea that wasteland cannot be owned and is thus legally subject to seizure, which underwrote colonial land grabs throughout the age of exploration and beyond. John Locke is often credited with the development of this principle. His contribution was the idea that because it is a divine injunction to improve land, anyone who, quote, in obedience to this command of God, 
subdued, tilled, and sowed any part of the earth, thereby annexed to it something that was his property, which another had no title to, nor could without injury take from him. This is right, the famous uh, kind of articulation of the idea that land that isn't being used is not owned. In order to own something, you have to mix your labor with it. So you mix your labor with the soil and thereby take possession of the land. Legal historian Richard Tuck points out that Locke was influenced in this formulation, this is of course 18th century, 17th century, by the writings of the Dutch political theorist Hugo Grotius, who was himself initially influenced by the Italian um, jurist and father of international law, um, Alberico Gentili, who often cited with enthusiasm the passages from Utopia to which I've just alluded. So in other words, this is, I think, so incredibly interesting, more it imagines this principle of terra nullius in Utopia, right? It then, you know, it is read by a jurist who is influenced by it, who then further influences another legal writer who influences John Locke, who codifies it into practice. So thus the justification for appropriating uncultivated lands from indigenous peoples moved from imaginative literature first to political principle second to real world practice third. Moore's island nation followed many more politically progressive practices, however, so it wasn't all just colonial land grabs, um, that became standard elements of future utopias, both fictional and real world ones. As the character of Thomas More inside the text acknowledges of the utopians, quote, the linchpin of their entire social order is their life in common without any use of money, quote. Jameson, Frederick Jameson notes that Quote, Moore's initial utopian gesture, the abolition of money and property, runs through the utopian tradition like a red thread, now aggressively affirmed on the surface, now tacitly presupposed in milder forms or disguises. As we shall see, it was the embrace of communism from the earliest iterations of utopia that made the genre attractive to 19th century socialist reformers, as well as to Marxist theorists from the 19th century onward. It's one of the paradoxes of utopia that a literary genre dedicated to describing idealized and perhaps impossible worlds, the world, the word itself does mean no place after all, has from its beginnings been so entangled with real world practice. So of the few dozen literary utopias written in English during the three centuries following Moore's inaugural text, um, so really it was a, a kind of a fallow period for utopia, not much was written in the next 300 years. Margaret Cavendish's imaginary ethnography, the description of a new world called the Blazing World, 1666, is currently the most famous or canonical example. It describes the adventures of a young aristocratic woman who travels to a parallel world adjacent to the North Pole, inhabited by rational animal-human hybrid creatures who live in total harmony. Um, although Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, 1726, so 60 years later, is predominantly a satire, its final section describing the idealized land of the Huynhams, the horse people, has strongly utopian elements. Both texts avoid describing the utopian dignity of indigenous people by populating their ideal worlds with humanoid animals. In other words, they sidestep the whole question of whether or not the natives can be rational, right, by making the inhabitants of the utopias into animals. They do, however, enshrine other key components of early literary utopia, the abolition of private property and money, and the location of their ideal worlds in a physically separate space, accessible through travel, even if it's arduous travel. Not until the cusp of the 19th century would utopian authors begin to locate their imaginary worlds in the future. This is a really important um, you know, historical development, right? Is that the earliest utopias were all like, oh, you, you sail a certain distance and then you come across this place. Um, at the beginning of the 19th century, authors became much more interested in thinking about utopia as uh, an idealized society that would exist in the future or could exist in the future. The development of progressive political ideals during the enlightenment wrought a change in utopia. Um, as Fatima Vira, Viria argues, quote, by projecting the ideal society in the future, the utopian discourse enunciated a logic of causalities that presupposed that certain actions of a political nature might afford the changes that were necessary in order to make the imagined society come true. So as utopian authors shifted from critiquing their own societies through satirical comparison, they began imagining what real world alternatives would look like. 
Utopian discourse took on the prescriptive flavor of a blueprint, the description of a social organization that might and should happen in the future. So the earliest utopians were mostly interested in satirizing um, by comparison their own, the author's own societies. These later utopias that are imagining ones in the future start actually thinking maybe this is a way to think about how a, a better life could come about, right? This is, we could actually build these kinds of things in the future. The 19th century, which is where we're getting to our, our period, was a period of extraordinary efflorescence of utopias. While there were about 70 English language utopias written between 1516 and 1800, seven, only 70 in about 300 years, the 19th century alone saw the publication of over 400 utopian novels in English, fully half of which were published between 1887 and 1895. So 1887 is the year that Edward Bellamy's book, Looking Backward, appeared, hugely influential. Morris actually writes News from Nowhere as a direct response to Edward Bellamy in 1895. So that's just like this, you know, eight years of um, 200 novels being written. Um, Bellamy's novel and William Morris's response not only sparked a craze for utopia writing that lasted over a decade, they specifically jump-started a vogue for prescriptive utopias set in the future. The two authors' utopian blueprints form the ends of the spectrum. While Bellamy envisions, and Bellamy's, Bellamy's an American writer, he envisions an idyllic America in the year 2000 where just, whose just and equitable society is enabled by technological development and the gradual consolidation of capital and huge monopolies that are eventually taken over by the state. Morris, on the other hand, sketches a future neo-feudal pastoral idyll in which human beings live in harmony with nature, dwell in small communal units, and labor by hand. So Morris is basically responding to Bellamy's techno future by saying, that's not the way it's going to happen. We're going to actually be returning to this kind of simpler agrarian form of life. That's my vision of utopia. So most utopias written in the 1890s deliberately position themselves in one or the other of these two camps both of which, it is important to note, were pr predicated on communal property relations and the solution of the labor problem through collectivity, very much in the spirit of Moore's original text. Indeed, part of the reason for the boom in literary utopias during this period was the growth of socialism and vice versa, um, in the form of both revolutionary Marxism and other gradualist socialist movements such as Fabianism and Great Britain's independent labor party. Both agrarian and techno literary utopianists are thus responding and contributing to the growth of real world political movements and texts and events, sorry, political movements and events. This was also the decade, however, the 1890s that saw a mini boom in dystopian novels. We haven't even talked about dystopia yet, another whole topic um, that openly critique the traditional communist basis of utopia. As Gregory Clays has discussed at length, the anti-socialist utopia typically depicts a revolution that turns into a dictatorship. Often such novels warn of compulsory labor or detail eugenicist schemes of population control and species improvement through enforced selective breeding. The ideal society of Anthony Trollope's, and I know uh, Grace Moore is here, who's a Trollope scholar. Um, the ideal society of Anthony Trollope's The Fixed Period, 1892, for example, depends on a scheme of voluntary euthanasia for everyone at the age of 68. Walter Besant's The Inner House, 1888, um, on the other hand, describes a population stable society controlled by elite scientists who have discovered an elixir of immortality all of its citizens live in a passionless stupor and must wait for someone to die by accident before anyone is allowed to reproduce. Not all the novels of this period that depict state-sponsored state -sponsored eugenics can be characterized as dystopian, however. And this is where it gets really complicated and interesting. Eugenics itself, as deplorable and evil as we now understand it to be, and as it turned out to, to be in practice, contained strongly utopian elements in its earliest incarnations. Francis Galton, who coined the term eugenics in 1883, responded to anxieties about the so-called degeneration of the human species, um, which was supposedly caused by depleted physical strength due to urban living and lack of manual labor among the, the upper classes. So originally 
this anxiety about degeneration was thought to really just be a problem of the upper classes because they weren't um, laboring by laboring by hand anymore. So they're becoming weaker, right? Um, so Francis Galton um, responded to these anxieties by trumpeting the capacity of selective interbreeding of the gifted, quote unquote, to bring about a higher, and these are all words he uses, type of human being. While most utopias, including Moore's own, imagine the physical improvement of human beings in some form, usually through the application of healthful labor, outdoor weather, better food, or even selective marriage, it is until the 1890s that eugenicist and socialist thought began to overlap in the realm of utopia. Many prominent British socialist, socialists openly espoused eugenicist ideas. In his 1905 novel, A Modern Utopia, H.G. Wells, who was a committed Fabian, depicts an ideal society ruled by a class of physically and mentally superior beings known as samurai, named after Japanese samurai, um, whom, the whom the narrator explicitly likens to the guardians in Plato's Republic. More chillingly, in his pamphlet, The Decline in the Birth Rate, um, of this is a pamphlet that came out in 1907, Sidney Webb, who was a driving force behind the Fabian Society, complained that, quote, in Great Britain at this moment, children are being freely born to the Irish Catholics and the Polish, Russians and German Jews on the one hand, and to the thriftless and irresponsible, largely the casual laborers and the other denizens of the one-room tenements of our great cities on the other. And when he says on the one hand and on the other, he doesn't mean one is good and the other is bad. He means they're both aspects of bad, right? That was his uh, racist and eugenicist idea. Um, it is one thing to note that early eugenicist thinking contained a utopian element, the dream of a better society, and quite another to notice that utopia itself is deeply and perhaps inextricably entangled with eugenicist schemes and ideals. As the political philosopher Bertrand de Jumenel wrote in his 1946 treatise on power, so 1946, so that's obviously the context in which he's writing this, quote, take a look at the way in which the master builders of paradises, the Plato's, the Moors, the Campanellas, set about it. They get rid of the clashes by getting rid of the differences. These dreams are, one and all, of tyrannies, of straighter, heavier, more oppressive tyrannies than any that history has yet shown us." Unquote. Yet, critiques of utopia did not have to await the 20th century, the rise of fascism, and the aftermath of two world wars. Karl Marx himself famously denigrated contemporary utopian socialists for, for different reasons, for engaging in, quote, fantastic schemes standing apart from the contest in an attempt to deaden the class struggle and to reconcile the class antagonisms. According to Marx, the followers of Owen, Fourier, and Saint-Simon are distracted from the revolution by their continued fixation on the, quote, experimental realization of their social utopias, of founding um, isolated phalansteries, of establishing home colonies, of setting up a little acaria, and to realize all these castles in the air, they are compelled to appeal to the feelings and purses of the bourgeois. So basically Marx thought that thinking about utopian societies was a kind of opiate, right, of the masses, just like religion. It's a kind of a fantasy or a dream world rather than actually doing the hard work of class struggle and revolution as Marx saw it, uh, it was a kind of a sop, right, to keep you from being focused on the actual real world problems. For most theorists writing in the wake of Marx, the construction of detailed blueprints for a specific future society has been seen at best as a distraction from the immediate and pressing tasks of social change, and at worst as an ideological compensation akin to religion. As the historian and scholar of utopia Ruth Levitas argues, however, the quote, real dispute between Marx and Engels and the utopian socialists is not about the merit of goals or of images of the future, but about the process of transformation. In other words, the Marxists and the so-called utopian socialists debated primarily the means by which a worker's paradise will be affected through an actual revolution in the case of Marx or through quote, an appeal to all classes on the basis of reason and justice, unquote. And as we'll talk more about when we read Morris, he kind of fudged this question, right? He like. Basically, he has his revolution or his, his huge change that, that brings about the ideal 
design in the future as kind of happening through both means, right? Both revolution um, uh, and I think I think I actually talk about this a little bit later in the paper, so I'll just get there when I uh, when I when I do. Um, a deeper difference between the two sides is the extent to which they see the description of blueprints for utopia, including literary texts, to be inherently transformative or a dangerous distraction from the pragmatic business of revolution. That said, the conflict between Marxism and utopian socialism should not be overstated. Levitas argues that it is less dark than it appears, noting that, quote, an outline of the principal features of a communist society can be pieced together from the writings of Marx and Engels, who can thus be seen as indulging in their own blueprint making. So they weren't really as against blueprints as they like to say, because they also did envision what this new ideal communist society would look like. As Roger Payton notes, Marx and Engels incorporated a number of specific elements cribbed from British and French utopian thinkers in their own descriptions of the post-revolutionary workers paradise. Most importantly, they took from the utopian socialists a specific conception of what it was to be a politically engaged utopian thinker. Utopianism in this view is a political project involving the description of an ideal society to be used both as a goal to guide social reform and as a normative standard to critically evaluate existing societies. Um, and here's where I talk about what I was just uh, referring to before. Morris's News from Nowhere, the most influential and widely read utopia by a British socialist author, elegantly fudges the question of how the new social organization is to be affected. In chapters entitled How the Change Came and the Beginning of the New Life, the historian Old Hammond describes to William Guest, the Victorian time traveler narrator, who's found himself mysteriously transported to an ideal future England, how their utopian society came about. Morris includes both gradualist elements, the influence of newspapers, the formation of powerful unions, and revolutionary elements, a massacre in Trafalgar Square and brutal police and military crackdowns in his imaginary account of how the change came. However it envisions the transformation coming about, the 19th century literary utopia still retains a laser-eyed focus on problems of labor and distribution, often sketching ideal social organizations in which labor is undertaken freely without official remuneration and in return, everyone is supported by a centralized economy administered by the state. Usually, money as such does not exist. The keen student of the century's utopias will notice, however, that the literary imagination often falters when it comes to envisioning true social equality. The women of Bellamy's Looking Backward, for example, despite their separate but equal industrial army, are still considered ornaments who leave their, the men to their cigars after dinner, while a rigid gendered division of labor, men in the fields, women in the house, still pertains in News From Nowhere. Neither novel has anything at all to say about race relations. More subtly, many authors fail to perceive how their ideal societies are propped up by the same problematic institutions as their real life ones. And I think this becomes a really key question um, and then I know in my breakout group, we actually touched on this idea a little bit. It's like, you know, to what extent are we uh, relying on hidden things that are never really explained for how the societies actually manage to function, right, as, as utopias? Um, as Dr. Leet, the 20th century utopian explainer in Looking Backward, proudly explains to his guest from the 19th century, money no longer exists in their ideal society. Quote, a credit corresponding to his share of the annual product of the nation is given to every citizen. And a credit card issued him with which he procures at the public storehouses whatever he desires, unquote. Each credit card, moreover, is, quote, issued for a certain number of dollars, which serve as, quote, al algebraical symbols for comparing the values of products with one another, unquote. <laughs> In other words, money, right? Um, that is, for all of Bellamy's powers of imagination, he seems incapable of imagining a society really that has no money. Mor Morris does get there, as we'll see. Um, while this insight is perhaps an unfair quibble, we see deeper economic problems at work in Morris's Nowhere. As Hammond explains to Guest, here's a first block quote that I'll put up here, um, in the last age of civilization, men had got into a vicious circle in the matter of production of wares. They had reached wonderful facility of production and in order to make the most of that facility, they had gradually created or allowed to grow rather a most elaborate system of buying and selling, which has been called the world market. 
And that world market, once set a going, forced them to go on making more and more of these wares. Yet, as we soon learn, the new anxiety in, in this utopia, in, in Morris's text, is that instead of a surplus of consumable objects, there will be a surplus of laboring bodies. No warians worry that the supply of pleasant labor will dry up. Thus, emigration, so in their society, everyone works because, for the, because of the love of working, right? And so they actually become anxious that so there's not gonna be enough work to do anymore. Um, thus, emigration becomes an integral part of the new economic organization. Those lands, which were once the colonies of Great Britain, for example, for, for instance, and especially America, that part of it above all, which was once the United States, are now and will be for a long while a great resource to us. For nearly a hundred years, the people of the northern parts of America have, in, have been engaged in gradually making a dwelling place out of a stinking dust heap, and there is still a great deal to do. <laughs> it's like, that's what Morris thinks of us. Um, even in a world with abundant sustenance for all, a new scarcity is imagined. Emigration becomes a necessary prop to the system, just as colonial markets were necessary to maintain adequate economic demand for products and goods. So in other words, all of these self-contained societies, they're not self-contained at all. They all, almost all of them, imagine an elsewhere to utopia that will actually help them prop up their ideal society, either as a place where people can emigrate to or a place where goods can be or a place where excess population can go, right? So very few of them are actually thinking of themselves as purely self-contained. While most Victorian literary utopias are activated by deep skepticism about 19th century capitalism's optimistic discourse of simultaneous infinite growth and self-contained sustainability, their critique of capital often results in depictions of a future society that is unable to escape the same contradictions as the one from which it sprung. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the 20th century. The 20th century, I'm about three quarters of the way through, so um, won't be too much longer. Uh, the 20th century saw two crucial developments in utopia. First, the concept was taken up by Marxist philosophers associated with the Frankfurt School, uh, perhaps ironically, given Marx's own antipathy to the term, and also given serious consideration as both a political force and a psychological drive. Second, the literary utopia seemed to disappear, muscled out by a wave of dystopias and utopia-dystopia hybrids, novels depicting worlds that think of themselves as utopian, in other words, the worlds think of themselves as utopian, but which readers are clearly meant to revile and condemn. Indeed, both trends could be seen as continuing to dominate utopian discourse up to the present moment. But as we shall see in the final section of this chapter, there's perhaps a bit of hope left when it comes to literary utopia, a little bit of energy left for imagining and describing ideal worlds, even if it is found in unlikely places. So to start with the writings of the Marxist philosopher Ernst Bloch, who's kind of one of the most uh, famous and influential theorists of utopia in the 20th century. Um, his multi-volume treatise, uh, the Principle of Hope, which was published between 1954 and 1959, um, has been enormously influential on later utopian theorists. Bloch's crucial contribution is his description of what he called the utopian impulse, a general orientation toward utopian hope that spills over from the political and literary realms. So for Bloch, the utopian impulse manifests in either concrete or abstract forms. Those were the terms that he used. The former, the concrete, which he also called anticipatory utopia, refers to reality-directed schemas of social reform, such as intentional communities and revolutionary practice. The latter, abstract or compensatory utopia, refers to personal wishes and daydreams and can be found in an array of cultural formations such as music, architecture, popular culture, myths, daydreams, even medicine. The former are social and the latter are selfish. The former are or can be properly Marxist, while the latter are essentially ideological, right? Or again, the kind of opiate. Yet Bloch is careful not to draw artificial or untenable distinctions. The distinction between concrete and abstract utopia is one of function rather than form. Both kinds of impulse can be found in different kinds of cultural production. For Bloch, hope is the central term. Indeed, that's part of the title of the magnum opus. 
there's a core of political energy to be harnessed even in the most selfish and rubbishy dreams of a better future. The trick is to precipitate a nugget of concrete utopia from the dross of compensatory abstract longings. For Bloch, what remains is, quote, an unfinished forward dream that, quote, can only be discredited by the bourgeoisie that seriously deserves the name utopia. Bloch expends a lot of space attempting to distinguish concrete from abstract utopia, the wheat from the chaff, yet there's an unsatisfyingly circular feel to his analysis. Concrete utopia is what survives after the passing of the ephemeral um, particular personal wishes, yet this cultural surplus is by definition concrete utopia. As Frederick Jameson somewhat waggishly notes, there is here at work the same hermeneutic paradox Freud confronted when searching for precursors of his dream analysis, he finally identified one obscure Aboriginal tribe for whom all dreams had sexual meanings, except for overtly sexual dreams, which meant something else. Yet as Ruth Levitas points out, it is ultimately unimportant that the criteria are obscure by which concrete utopia is distinguished from abstract utopia. Bloch's project is fundamentally to rehabilitate the entire concept of utopia within Marxism as a neglected Marxist category. So basically because utopia and Marxism got off on the wrong foot by Marx using that term to denigrate these concrete schemas, um, Marxist philosophers and theorists and have, have always kind of been suspicious of it and Bloch's goal in the 50s was to say, no, we need to think about, utopia needs to be part of thinking about um, you know, the workers' struggle and et cetera. Um, in the end, Bloch was successful if we measure success by the extent to which utopia has been taken seriously as a category by Marxist and other leftist critics in the 20th and 21st centuries. Jameson, Frederick Jameson, the most prominent such critic, sidesteps the problems of Bloch's original schema by reinscribing abstract versus concrete utopia as a question of form. And this is Jameson, a quote from him. The properly utopian program or realization will involve a commitment to closure and thereby to totality. It is, quote, the very impress of the form and category of totality, which is virtually by definition lacking in the multiple forms invested by Bloch's utopian impulse. So in other words, Jameson is interested in the ways in which all utopias imagine themselves as closed. Um, and so that's kind of what I was referring to before. The idea that you know utopia is simultaneously thinking of itself as self-contained, but also, on the other hand, kind of often failing to acknowledge the ways in which something outside of itself has to exist in order for utopia to be able to function. Um, the, total the totalization of closure is a key feature of utopia beginning with Moore's Island, which has been transformed by the colonial conquerors. This is a really fascinating bit um, in Moore's t Utopia, where the, the, the conquerors who, who came and took over the island, they quote, caused a channel 15 miles wide to be excavated at that end of the peninsula joined to the mainland, so surrounding it with the sea. So they basically engage in a sort of early kind of terraforming uh, or you know, uh, geoengineering where they basically turn this peninsula into an island. So their first impulse is to say, we're at we're going to have an ideal society. It needs to be shut off from the rest of the world. We can see a commitment to closure in nearly all, dare we say all, literary utopias ever since, either geographical separation, islands, hollow earths, hyperborean poles, extraterrestrial colonies, or temporal separation, ideal civilizations that exist in the future or the past. So like I said before, in, in almost all cases, utopias imagine themselves as shut off. The work of Herbert Marcuse, this is our, the next 20th century critic I'm going to talk about, a psychoanalytic and Marxist critic and member of also member of the Frankfurt School, potentially points another way beyond the impulse impasse between liberatory and ideological views of utopia. For Marcuse, the psychoanalytic reality principle contains first a necessary element, the control of anarchic selfishness in the process of, social, of socialization. In other words, you know, this is the insight of Freud that we are all infants are all id and we all have to learn how to control our, our impulses in order to be, become members of society. And that's what is happening through the process of socialization of a child. Um, so this, the reality principle contains first a necessary element. We all have to learn how to not just do whatever we want in order to live in a society. So that piece of it is necessary. But Marcuse also talked about how there was a second aspect 
of the reality principle, which is a surplus element whose function is to ensure dominance and hierarchy. So sure, we all need to be socialized to live together in a society, but we don't need to necessarily be socialized to like, you know, go along like sheep with the, the rules of, of capitalism, right? According to Marcuse. Um, different modes of, but to be clear, he, all societies do this, right? He doesn't think it's just capitalism. Different modes of production are associated with different modes of domination and, and therefore different modes of repression. So Marcuse names the particular form that surplus rep repression takes under capitalism, the performance principle, and does so, quote, in order to emphasize that under its rule, society is stratified according to the competitive economic performance of its members. So that's the particular form that that extra repressive principle takes in capitalism. It takes different forms in other kinds of societies. So like, for example, in a monarchy, it would take the form of a belief in the hierarchical rightness, the rightness of the hierarchy of classes or whatever, right? In capitalism, it, it, it takes the form of an internalized imperative to perform, um, to perform economically. This performance principle has several crucial features. First of all, it renders labor pervasive and all encompassing. And I think it's really interesting to think that like Marcuse is writing this in the middle of the 20th century. I've read like three or four books lately because of course I'm interested in utopia and how it even shades over into self-help about right, how we all now have internalized this idea that we have to be working all the time. So he was writing about this 50 years ago and we're still talking about it. Um, two, it necessitates the repression of eros, right, or the libidinal or erotic um, dimension of human life. Repressive desublimation sanctions and allows certain performances of libido that are channeled by and contained by the system of domination. This is perhaps one of the most interesting bits of Marcuse's thinking is that when we imagine that we're like letting loose and, and actually, um, you know, letting out our libido and, and, and we're allowing it to have certain forms of expression, it's done in a very, you know, it's done in a, you know, in such a way that it actually kind of doesn't really allow for actual self-expression, right? So that there are certain like escape valves built into a social structure, um, like parties and Mardi Gras and things like that, where it's like, this is the space where you go to let loose spring break. Um, but because it's very constrained and circumscribed, you're not really actually challenging the system. You're just doing it in this very particular channeled way, right? And then the third aspect is it, it curtails the realm of human freedom. The free space which the individual has at his disposal for his psychic processes has been gr greatly narrowed down. It is no longer possible for something like an individual psyche with its own demands and decisions to develop. The space is occupied by public social forces. So these are Marcuse's three problems with uh, the way the performance principle operates in capitalism. Utopias are entirely about imagined alternatives and Marcuse elaborates how difficult it is for subjects of modern capitalism to imagine an alternative to a social organization governed by the performance principle. This I think is really key. And this goes back to something we were talking about in my breakout room as well, right? What to what, you know, why is it that it's so difficult to imagine? And this is kind of a commonplace saying, right? Like Jameson himself sometimes says this, like, you know, capital, like it's impossible for us to imagine anything. We, it's easier for us to imagine the end of the world than it is for us to imagine the end of capitalism, right? And so Marcuse was already talking about where that, where that problem comes from. In the last pages of the Fantasy and Utopia chapter of his big book, Eros and Civilization, Marcuse works through the implications of an imagined, and that is utopian, non-repressive reality principle. So what would it look like for a society to have a reality principle? We all need to have social rules. We need to like learn how to just not do whatever we want and we're to all get along and have a social organization, right? But what would such a reality principle look like that wasn't repressive, right? That only, that only repressed us just as much as we needed to in order to be social, but didn't have this extra surplus of repression of domination, right? Um, because our current social organization is characterized by an, according to him, an unnecessary anxiety over scarcity, and the inculcation of false desires, right, that are that are put into our heads through advertising, et cetera, it easily co-opts any attempts to improve or supplement the present existence by more contemplation or more leisure. A utopian, non-repressive reality principle would require nothing less than a complete reorganization of the psyche, an alteration in the balance between what Marcuse calls eros and thanatos, or the death drive, 
a reactivation of tabooed realms of gratification and the pacification of the quote unquote conservative tendencies of the instincts. In other words, and again, going back to something we touched on in my breakout room, we'd have to completely rethink the human being, right? In a sense, or, or not that it would be impossible. None of these things are inherent to us as human beings, but they are, um, they feel inherent to us because of the way we live under this particular social regime. Eros, or the pleasure principle, is the source of the utopian desire for a better world. While it's constantly struggling against forces of surplus repression, Marcuse envisions a world in which this non-repressive reality principle allows for the sublimation of Eros into non-alienated labor, labor that occasions true satisfaction and joy, and that's something that Morris is very interested in as well. One of the ways this process can be affected is through imagination and the arts, what Marcuse terms the aesthetic dimension. Imagination envisions the reconciliation of the individual with the whole, of desire with realization, of happiness with reason. While this harmony has been removed into utopia by the established reality principle, in other words, we think of it as impossible, uh, fantasy insists that it must and can become real, that behind the illusion lies knowledge. The truths of imagination are first realized when fantasy itself takes form, when it creates a, uni a universe of perception and comprehension. This occurs in art. So for Marcuse, like the aesthetic dimension, as he termed it, the world of imagination, artistic production is where this, where this all can happen still, even under a, a repressive regime. The crucial 20th century development in the domain of literary utopia was its near disappearance. The first, the first dystopias appeared, as we have seen, as critical responses to the boom of late Victorian utopian novels, and the two modes coexisted for a decade or so before dystopia gained the upper hand. The novels of H.G. Wells at the turn of the century, particularly When the Sleeper Wakes, 1899, and A Modern Utopia, 1905, inaugurated a powerful vision of utopia gone awry through the betrayal of revolutionary ideals. Yet as the title of the latter suggests, A Modern Utopia, it is not entirely clear to what extent Wells is predicting, excoriating, or endorsing various authoritarian elements of the societies he depicts. Wells is a really complicated figure, right? It's like, is he an authoritarian? Is he a socialist? It's kind of hard to tell. Wells was committed or perhaps reconciled to the necessity of a world state in order to affect social reform. But his literary visions of such worlds shimmer between utopia and dystopia, re refusing to resolve definitively into one or the other. Wells arguably brought forward contradictory elements in utopia, totalitarianism, uniformity, repression, eugenics, latent in the genre all along that were picked up and developed by the authors of dystopias in the years following the world wars. The most influential of such novels were Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, 1932, George or I was actually shocked to realize that it was written that long ago. I thought I thought of as much more recent. George Orwell's 1984, which was written in 1949, and Anthony Burgess's A Clockwork Orange, 1962. All three depict future worlds characterized by state brutality and a compliant populace, and concern themselves primarily with the problem of free will under a repressive regime. Utopia secured by authoritarianism was a central perhaps the central theme of dystopian novels throughout much of the 20th century. Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, 1985, for example, one of the most important dystopias of the century, imagines a future theonomic American society in which women are subjugated to a patriarchal political order that brutally represses their freedom using Christian scriptures as the basis for secular law. At the time of its publication, indeed, at the time that I was first writing this essay, <laughs> such a society seemed a far-fetched thought experiment, but of course certain political developments since then have brought us closer to what Atwood was envisioning. Um, if there is a general theme to dystopias from the latter decades of the 20th century until today, it would be civilizational collapse rather than the growth of Stalinist authoritarianism. I think it's just so interesting to think like now all the ways we envision dystopia are that a breakdown of society rather than an oppressive or authoritarian regime. Often such collapse is brought about by environmental catastrophe in the form of uncontrolled climate change, pandemic, nuclear war, or other ecological disaster 
and the societies, which are not always civilizations, that follow are just as often chaotic as they are totalizing and repressive. Notable examples include Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, The Children of Men by P.D. James, Parable of the Sower and a Parable, of the Parable of the Talents by Octavia Butler, The Road by Cormac McCarthy, The Wind Up Girl, um, the Mad Adam trilogy by Margaret Atwood and the Hunger Games trilogy as well. Some of the novels on the above list skirt the blurred boundary with science fiction, as do the handful of recent novels that could be characterized as proper utopias. Frederick Jameson's enormously influential critical work, um, Archaeologies of the Future, The Desire Called Utopia and Other Science Fictions, traces the long entanglement of the two literary modes. Classifying science fiction is a notoriously tricky task, but a sort of rough and ready definition would include narratives that depict space exploration and extraterrestrial civilizations, advanced science and technology, and or time travel. So Earth, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's The Dispossessed, 1974, and Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time, 1976, are examples of important science fiction novels that are also utopias in a traditional sense. Many of the science fiction novels of Kim Stanley Robinson imagine future worlds that are utopian in their basic outlines. Robinson has recently provided an influential definition of utopia as a positive course in history, the best possible given where we are, given our technological base. His recent novel, The Ministry for the Future, which came out a couple of years ago, and I recommend, it's uh, really fascinating and, and inspiring, um, published after the interview in which um, that definition that I just gave was proposed, imagines a near future world that has responded in useful ways to catastrophic climate events. Um, it could be characterized more accu accurately as technocratic speculative fiction maybe than science fiction per se. Um, other notable, lo another notable locus for literary utopianism is African futurism. Uh, according to Nigerian author Nde or, uh, Okorafor, who wrote the book called Lagoon in 2014, um, who coined the term, African futurism is concerned with visions of the future, is interested in technology, leaves the earth, skews optimistic, is centered on and predominantly written by people of African descent, black people, and it is rooted first and foremost in Africa. It's less concerned with what could have been and more concerned with what is and can or will be. So these are just some places where we could locate uh, the utopian impulse or the desire to think through ideal um, worlds, future worlds that are kind of on the ground right now. It is undeniable that literary utopias are rather thin at the moment. <laughs> there, there aren't a lot of them and have been for over a hundred years. It is something of a commonplace to note that after the horrors of the 20th century, which show few signs of abating in the 21st, the distaste for optimist optimistic visions of the future makes perfect sense. And yet, if not now, when? The writing, reading, and analyzing of literary utopias seems more important than ever as the urgency of imagining other modes of social organization becomes increasingly apparent. The alternative is worse. Okay, so, um, Water here. That is my kind of sketch or schema of the history of literary utopia up to the present, which is um, kind of functioning or uh, furnishing, I hope, a background to where my project is coming from, like why I decided this is something I was interested in thinking through, like where is utopia headed now? Uh, and even just, I think I, I want to say I started this project thinking about it about two years ago, maybe a little bit less. And even in that short period of time, I've been really startled at how much writing has come out, right, about this very, like, it feels like people are really, again, the zeitgeist, I'm just tapping into something that I think is going on in the broader culture, but people are really starting to think about, well, what are, what are, what are our, our alternatives, right? Like what, instead of just giving into despair, what are we, what are we going to do to think about um, possible al alternative futures? So, Okay, um, so I'm just gonna give you a, our time is here, okay. Uh, a quick little overview of the book chapters and then spend just a tiny bit of time talking about each one and then open it up for questions and discussions. So um, the way the book is organized is uh, there'll be first an introduction, which basically talks about a little bit about um, you know, where Utopia is now. And then this is the breakdown here. I'm not gonna, I've got a slide for each one of these things. So I'll just kind of show you what the overview is there and then kind of dive into each one briefly. 
Um, so the introduction provides a definition and brief history of literary utopia, including the utopia craze I just described to you in the late 19th century, discuss, discusses the exhaustion of utopian writing in the, in the 20th and 21st century, gives an overview of the rest of the book. Um, the book is divided into three sections, the past, the present, and the future, right? So section one, each, in each section has two chapters. So in the past, the first chapter is actually going to be dedicated to John Ruskin. So it, it will talk about some other environmentalist writers in the 19th century as well, but he is the main, the main dude. Um, provides an overview of Ruskin's work, his legacy as an environmental thinker. The two texts that it focuses on are The Crown of Wild Olive and The Storm Cloud of the 19th Century, which is this very kind of wacky uh, and wonderful uh, series of long lectures where he delves into the problem of the sky, right? The fact that clouds look different to him than they did 30 or 40 years before. And he and he is because of environmental pollution. So it's kind of one of the first uh almost kind of um this you know the silent spring kind of writings about uh about what's happening around us because of of changes in the environment. Um, it's also partly a personal essay about how much I love Ruskin, right? So how much how much he meant to me and how uh, you know reading Ruskin also was kind of the occasion for my awakening as, as an environmentalist thinker as well. Um, the second chapter, which I'm calling a crystal age, is named after one of the utopias I'm going to talk about called the crystal age. So it basically dives into the utopian literature of the Victorian period. It talks in depth about news from nowhere, of course, a crystal age, the inner house, garden cities of tomorrow, the fixed period, and several others, but those are the main ones that I spend most of the time on. So the, the, basically I, I kind of talk about the premises of these novels and the ways in which their authors are envisioning utopia and kind of try to make the argument that these novels, which are really largely unread, except from among literary critics, honestly, um, have something to teach us still about how to think as utopians. And what I'm interested in, with any utopian novel is what are the sort of the deep and unspoken things that we think are impossible. Uh, utopia is very good at laying out the things that we think we can be done, right? An author sits down to write utopia because he, he or she imagines this is something that could be achieved. Uh, but what are the things, what are the parameters that aren't spoken? What are the things that limit what we imagine um, are possible? What are, and then kind of finally, what are the queries that we want to pose to these imagined societies from our own historical vantage point? So what are the things, the kinds of questions that we want to ask of them and, and kind of how would we imagine ourselves having a dialogue with the authors of these texts? So the second section will be about the present. Um, the first chapter is what I'm calling soft, soft nihilism. So Naomi Klein coined the term soft denial, which she used to refer to the fact that uh, even among people who, who admit that the truth, the reality of climate change, they're not deniers, uh, we still often act as though it's not happening, right? Of course. Um, we understand that global warming is happening, that climate change is, ha change is happening, but then inevitably we seem to forget. We remember and then we forget. So she uses the term soft denial, not hard denial, not, not saying it doesn't exist, but rather like, la, 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 I'm just not thinking about it, right? Um, so she coined this term about seven or eight years ago, but my contention is that it no longer even really, things have even changed since then, that denial no longer seems to capture our current state of helplessness and despair. Uh, so I am referring to this phenomenon as soft, not soft denial, but soft, soft nihilism. Um, so in this chapter, I discuss recent work by sociologists, psychologists, and indigenous activists uh, and and, and the, the perspective of indigenous people is a really important part of this book and of this work in general, um, as a lot of indigenous uh, writers have pointed out that they have been undergoing, you know, indigenous communities have been undergoing this despair for centuries, right? The, the, the loss and passing away of their worlds and their life ways um, has, has been in a slow, in some cases slow, in some cases much more fast, uh, unfolding disaster for a very long time. And so, you know, those of us colonizers are, are kind of just now catching up to being sad about the fact that, that our ways of life are changing. And so there's a lot to learn from indigenous um, writers around these issues. Um, and then it ends with an overview of the sort of recent uptake of the idea of eco-mourning 
uh, which is like, I can't even keep up with it. I mean, I used to have a file on my computer in which I tried to download every article in like the New York Times or the Guardian or the New Yorker anywhere that talks about, you know, climate grief. And I just can't, it's just everywhere now. So I'm going to basically spend a little bit of time in this chapter talking about how that happened and kind of tracing the trajectory of that, of that uptake. Um, the, oh, this is, I'm not going to read this to you, but um, I thought I would, I would maybe make these slides available to you all afterwards. And so there's a, a bibliography for some of these chapters in case you want to dive into some of these uh, books on your own. Um, chapter four is, uh, talks about these uh, climate grief groups. So I got, uh, I started kind of hanging out in some of these online groups because I was interested in these questions for my own scholarship and I'm kind of fascinated by them, right? So there's a, a, a movement called deep adaptation, which is basically uh, take takes for, so these groups kind of range from, from groups that take for granted either that civilization, um, I, I think the range is, it goes from like capitalism is about to collapse, right? So that we can no longer maintain this economic organization through to civilization is about to collapse through to, the you know the human species is about to come to an end. So it's like the whole range of pessimism, right? From like you know this kind of pessimism all the way up to like the 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 biggest amount of pessimism, which is you know that that even life on Earth um, is going to come to an end. So people in these groups basically spend time talking about how they're na navigating their their anxiety and grief, etc. Um, so I'm going to talk about like the phenomenon of this this rise in uh, in a kind of institutionalized place for ecological mourning to take place. Um, so here's a little short bibliography from of some works that talk about this phenomenon. And then the last section, the future, um, is hopefully where things get a little bit more hopeful. The chapter five, which is the one that's kind of, I think of as the heart of this project, right? The young utopians, uh, will be an overview of speculative nonfiction, um, extrapolating a future from our current environmental environmental or political moment. And again, this is now work that's just coming fast and furious. Like even since I started this, multiple, multiple books have come out basically saying like, here's how we use utopia to think about our future. Here's how we move from where we are through to these, this next phase, um, which is scary, et cetera, to imagining that things could actually you know, be better or be okay on the other end. Um, it will also talk about recent utopian fiction, of which there's not a ton. A lot of it's, like I said, a kind of hybrid of utopia or dystopia. Um, and it's also going to present the work of some of my students um, who have, have taught, you know, a lot of climate fiction classes. And, and I've taught a class in ecological mourning. And a lot of the, my way of keeping my finger to the ground or my nose to the ground or whatever, ear to the ear to the ground, I just <laughs> what the expression is, um, is by talking to my students about, um, you know, how is Gen Z taking all this and what are you, and in a lot of, a lot of cases, I'm actually sort of surprised by how, um, by how uh, not scared they are in a way, and you know, they're, they're, in a, they are scared, but they're resigned in a way that I think older generations like millennials and Gen, Gen Xers and boomers are, uh, have a very different orientation toward this. Um, and I think a lot of this is generational and I've written a lot about that before in, in other places. And then the final chapter, oh, sorry, here's the bibliography. There's, you can see there's quite a lot. I'm like I said, this is just a sampling. I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping up with it all. Uh, you'll see the last one listed there is the Half Earth Socialism, which is uh, we're gonna read excerpts uh, from it alongside um, our second discussion of the Morris novel, uh, partly because that book talks about Morris as an example, like actually explicitly uses News From Nowhere as an exemplar for ways we could think about uh, future social organizations. So, um, and then the, the last chapter I'm calling Walden Three, there's nothing written here <laughs> on this slide because I literally don't know what it's gonna be yet. This is like the one that I haven't even really started thinking about, but what I want it to be uh, is a chapter about actual utopian experiments. And part of the reason I haven't started writing this one is it's gonna require a lot more just kind of nuts and bolts research. You know, like um, there's a lot of different kinds of uh, intentional communities, some of which have been around for a very long time, some of which have, are more recent. And I basically have to kind of do a sort of triage and figure out like what's gonna be the, uh, you know, I'm gonna pick like th like three. I have I have a lead on a few. I have a, actually a good friend in, in New Zealand who has started um, a co-housing uh, co-housing place um, in New Zealand, 
Uh, I, one of the places I might consider and I'm thinking about is there's a, uh, t one of the Thich Nhat Hanh's communities is actually right here in North Mississippi, just about 20 minutes up the road, incredibly, uh, called Magnolia Village. So that might be another one, but this is very speculative at this point. So this is the chapter that I've done the least on, but this, this is what I'm envisioning it going to be. So, um, okay, so that's, that's my, the overview of my project. So now I guess I just want to open it up to questions and see if people have thoughts to share or questions for me. And I'll stop sharing my screen now so we can all see each other. Um, let me see where, how do I do that? Um, stop share, okay. Okay, great, thank you, thanks. So, um, I don't, Courtney, Renee, do you want to, should, do you want to moderate? Like, do you want to call on people or should people just do the little hand raisey thingy? I'm not sure what the best way to, to do the questions might be. I think probably the hand raisey thing is the easiest and I'm okay. happy to call on folks who raise their hand or, or okay. you can call on folks who raise their hand. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, Kath. Oh, I, you're, hi, you're, hi, oh, hi, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here. You're in the mic. Um, so it seems to me energy sources are the crux of a uh, utopia. Mm -hmm. And so you, the word has not been spoken in your talk. And um, I don't know where my question would be going, but <laughs> I just want to say, I think that's um, central to yeah. um, our movement away from uh, fossil fuels and away from slaves, away from all the mm -hmm. things that aren't working. Um, so I'm just putting that out. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I mean, in a way, I guess I take it as such an absolutely central, almost unspoken aspect of all of this that I almost felt like it isn't even necessary to say, but you're absolutely right. I should probably make that more clear that, um, that you know, all of the utopias I'm talking about, even the Victorian ones, even more, right? This one of the you know the central questions are questions about economic production and distribution, and that goes hand in hand with energy, right? What you know, uh, for Morris, he solves the problem. Well, we're going to talk about this more, and it's really interesting. He solves the problem, of course, by returning to an agrarian social organization that doesn't require energy, and yet there's also this mysterious thing that he makes up that he never really explains that somehow some kind of perfectly green efficient source of energy that just appears in the future and thereby solves everybody's problems. So a lot of what are things I'm interested in with utopias are what um, well, I taught a graduate seminar a couple of years ago and my graduate students started calling it the MacGuffin, right? So like what's the, when every time you read a new utopian novel, what's the MacGuffin? What's the thing that the author is like, oh, and by the way, there's this other minor detail, like we have a clean, uh, you know, a source of infinite green renewable energy, right? just, just a small little thing. Um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like the, the kind of the premise of all of this <laughs> is that uh, the unsustainability of our current energy regimes and the you know, and climate disaster because of them is what's going to necessitate new ways of thinking about um, about our social organization from the ground up. So like everything is being rethought. It's like, that's why I think Marcuse is so interesting. It's like, he's like, we have to rethink the human psyche. We have to rethink the very ways we orient ourselves toward nature. We have to rethink um, what we mean, what, you know, what do we mean by labor? What do we mean by, by energy? So yeah, I didn't at all mean to sidestep it. I, I think it's so central that I literally almost feel like I don't even need to talk about it, but thank you. Uh, point, ta point taken yeah. that yes, I should probably yeah. make that more clear. <laughs> thank you. I, li I like the point of Marcuse about the psyche and um, could also throw in the spirit, I think. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Hi, Grace. <laughs> Hi, Diana. Thank you. That was so interesting. Yeah, um, I'm really fascinated by the idea of integrating student work into your mm -hmm. project. And I'd love it if you could say a little bit more about that, please. Sure. Yes. Um, 
I, like I said, I, I find my students because, because you know, most of them are Gen Zers, not all of them. I have, you know, obviously some, some older students as well, but most of them are, are, you know, much younger. Uh, and, and one of the things I'm so interested in about this question, uh, you know, it's a question of, of environmental and social justice is like the generational problem, right? Like we, um, and, and, oh God, there's so much to say about this, but you know, the kind of like anger, right? That I think a lot of younger people um, uh, feel about the fact that the, you know, they're facing a future on the planet that's been kind of, you know, wrung out by, by previous generations, et cetera. So I think like talking to students about what their experience of this is and, and their take on it, just as young people is really important and interesting. And like, I, you know, like, because I'm a professor, I have access to all of these, all, you know, like um, focus groups every single day, right? Um, but also like, I just think uh, asking them like really specific questions about their, I, I mean, obviously I did this when we all did some more teaching anyway, but like thinking about it as more um, collaborative, right? Like that I want to hear what their specific takes are. Like, for example, I gave, already gave the example of the MacGuffin, right? Like um, having these courses, especially on, on utopian, literature, the climate fiction ones to a certain extent as well, they all seem to develop their own kind of fascinating vocabulary or, or take on what, what we're talking about together, right? So like one class is interested in the MacGuffin, another graduate seminar became really obsessed with just the concept of human nature. So it was like every single new novel we read, the, the central question would become, well, what does the author envision is they're going to do about human nature? And so I, you know, my job was to like kind of force them to unpack that idea. What do you mean by human nature? What does that actually entail? And what do the authors seem to think it entails, et cetera? So this is all a long-winded way of saying like, um, I, rather than just kind of letting it be impressionistic, I'm trying to come up with ways to, to be a little bit more focused and disciplined about gathering the thoughts and insights of my students with, with their permission, of course, and using them in my work as, you know, he, here's, here's an example of the way this particular class thought through this problem. Um, or here's a, here's, a, here's a perspective that I saw in a lot of my students with regard to this particular um, social issue, et cetera. So, so yeah, but it is like, I mean, I always tell them I'm doing, I'm like, I'm writing something about this and I wanna quote my students. Is it okay if I talk about how you said that or whatever? So, um, yeah, so I think it's been, it's made the classroom a little bit different too, better, I think, because I feel like my, I think, I feel like my students, or some of them have said this anyway, they have a little bit more of a stake in, in right, like the scholarship that I'm doing that's also trying to be kind of more public facing and more about uh, a broader audience. And so they have, they're contributing to it and collaborating with me on it as well, so yeah. I don't know if that kind of answered your question or I'd be happy to talk about it some more too in terms of nuts and bolts too, um, you know, later if you want. Uh, that's terrific. Thank you. I'd love right. that. Um, yeah, and right. No, I think it's so important because the, the the dialogue between our research and our teaching is something that doesn't always translate into the monograph. So it's mm -hmm. wonderful to think of that happening. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Hi, John. Hi. Um, this is wonderful work, Deanna, and Thank I, you. I, I, I want I, I want all the answers that you have discovered. <laughs> but there, there are no easy answers. Um, yeah. My 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 question, and it's prompted, I, I'm aware by the fact that it's Passover and Easter, is mm -hmm. ab about the role of religion and religious mm. thinking and religious thinkers in relation mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, utopia and, mm -hmm. and dystopia and yeah that's so fun yeah it, take us take us on that trip it's so funny you should ask that because this this is literally the first question that came up in my little breakout uh in my breakout room um it's interesting to note how very rare it is for religion to form a central part of utopia since the 19th century on, right? Like they're all, they're almost entirely secular. They're almost entirely. Um, and I think the reason for that is of course, the, the development of utopia as a genre from the 19th century forward is so intertwined with actual political developments of, you know, of, of socialist thinkers who were influenced by, 
Marx and, you know, envisioning secular societies, envisioning that the problems, uh, the solutions to all these problems were going to be economic and about distribution and production, et cetera. Um, so yeah, like it's, I mean, I think the biggest exception that I would note would be um, Octavia Butler, right? The Parable of the Sower. Um, how many people have read that book by, by any chance? Nobody? Oh, wow, okay. Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a 20th century, 20th? Maybe very early 21st, so 90s? Maybe, the, yeah, I think it's the 90s. Anyway, uh, book about, like disturbingly prescient book about a then, I think it's set in 2025. So I believe that the year in which it's all supposed to be going down is just a couple of years away. And it's basically depicts a, a future society in which um, there's kind of been this gradual breakdown because of you know all the, all the exact actual things that are going on in our world right now, climate change, um, hunger. Um, basically the United States is kind of like still functioning, but, but there's basically been a kind of a civil breakdown. So it, it um, depicts a young woman who is living in a, a gated community and these kind of gated communities have become these spa safe spaces where the vast majority of people are like live outside of them and they're just kind of roaming around Mad Max style, right? And, uh, and so her community is overrun and she's, she has to take to the road and try to um, travel north with like this little band of people that she gathers. But anyway, the point is that she's starting a religion. Um, it's told from the perspective of that's what parable is so right? It's told um, as a kind of a origin story for her as a prophet. So your, your understanding is that in the future, she's going to, um, she calls it earth seed is the name of the religion. And it's all about how these visions come to her and she uh, comes to understand, you know, the way of, of the, the, the utopian future will be through this kind of, this new religion that she founds and she's its prophet. And so for Butler, right, the, the two things are inextricable. And I think it's, I mean, it, it, it'll be interesting to see, because that book has also been so influential. Um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, to what extent that becomes a new important or, or central or integral part of, of utopia. So, I mean, I feel like I could probably talk about this for like a million hours. So I just, I just wanted to, to say, kind of just to put a pin in those two points. One, it's interesting to note how little religion has had to do with actual utopian visions in these literary fictions, right? And two, how maybe that's even changing um, that, you know, the, the spiritual element is, is starting. And uh, some of the YA fiction that I've read too, also kind of becoming interested in uh, questions of spirituality. And may, and again, maybe it goes back to the Marcuse that like, we can't, we can't just think of these things only as widgets <laughs> and nuts and bolts, you know, like it's not just about figuring out production and distribution, but it has to be about figuring out something about spirit as well and about like hope and, you know, hope comes in from, from different sources for different people. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey, Renee. Okay. Yeah, this is just a random comment, but religion and spirituality are different, or can be. Oh, no, and absolutely. I, oh, I want to say, no, I have my own complicated views on religion and utopia, but about 10 miles from me are the Amana colonies. It was the largest communist society in the United States in the 1880s, and it survived until the 1930s. As far as I can tell, it was successful. That is, if you were a 19th century factory worker or peasant, you would have been much better off to be in the Amana colonies. Mm -hmm. They were fairly egalitarian by the standards of the time. They gave quite a bit of choice to the individual worker. They all worked together, women and men with crutches and various support services, using the technology of the time. They were moderately advanced in, in learning new technologies because they really wanted to sell their cloth and and um, make their refrigerated related products successfully. They had some respect for education. They sent some of their members to the university to become doctors. Now they didn't produce a lot of literature so that doesn't fit in. Mm -hmm. But I would say, is that religion or is that ethnic mm -hmm. cohesion? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and that is a yeah. Also, there's an authoritarian element, but because it was a shared authoritarianism, it really wasn't as oppressive. Mm -hmm. I'm not yeah. saying I would have wanted to be a Mennonite. The Mennonites are near here too, or a member of the Old Order Amish. But within some of these groups, there was an egalitarianism. So I think it's complicated. They're not utopian. Yeah. Because right. if you were a dissident, it would be hell. But you mm -hmm. wouldn't have to be a dissident if you were equally treated. <laughs> well, I, I, yes. I mean, you put your finger right on it. That, uh, exactly on that, the, the, um, the work that I quoted about this kind of paradox of utopia, right? That um, it's the, the more uniform and the more... Um, the more uniform the society, the less dissent, the happier the people, right? In in a sense, right? And so, it's like the 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 problem I think for a lot of people thinking about how we're going to get from here to there is to imagine the transition period, right? In other words, how do we? That question about human nature is often usually just a reformulation of a question about our nature, right? So we we can't imagine people being any different from us in a, in a way, right? That how how are we going to get from here to there. Um, because I think everybody's capable of imagining like, oh sure, three generations from now, when everybody in the society was raised in the society and has had you know, internalized and inculcated those values, sure, then utopia will be possible. But is it possible to get from here to there? And I think often the one way to think about doing that is through a kind of a, 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 a a kind of artificial or enforced authoritarianism. And I think you're right, it's often like been envisioned as, but I mean, to go back to what, what you were originally, the, the first part of your point, maybe I should have also made this more clear in response to, to John's question. I was responding to it completely as from the literary utopia side. Actual utopias, right? Actual experiment, uh, utopian experiments in the US uh, in particular, but, but in Great Britain and elsewhere are almost always religious, right? Like, I don't know, I, I don't, wouldn't even have a percentage, but I would imagine some huge percentage of them are about, um, you know, starting a group around a shared set of values that are religious in nature or have a, you know, scriptural basis, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I would include, uh, I would include the Amish and, you know, a lot of um, Mennonite societies, Shakers, these are all, sh I mean, Shakers even probably even more that are explicitly utopian. Um, and as I said, one of my possible communities that I'm going to think about for my last chapter is the Zen monastery uh, up the road. So, yeah, I mean, this is a huge topic, and it and uh, it almost <laughs> it could be. I mean, another book. So, I know. <laughs> but yes, you're you're absolutely right that um, that the literary vision is bizarrely out of step with the actual on the ground what's actually being done, with the possible exception of Blythdale Romance, right? which only imagines an actual, um, you know, society in, in the United States in the 19th century to make fun of it, right? It's just a, a straight up satire of the whole idea of utopianism. So that doesn't really get us very far. But anyway, thank you for those comments. That's, that's super helpful. Yeah. Um, I think Renee was, had her hand up in that. So. Yeah, I just, um, in some ways this, this question is related to, to what you were saying just just a moment ago about like how do you how do you get from where we are now to utopia and then mm -hmm. the first question that came to mind Florence when you were just talking about the this um this uh communist society that ended in the 1930s was well why did it end like it was working really well why did it end and and I'm very interested in in how you get there and and what happens at the end and and mm -hmm. To my mind, in some ways, that's a question about genre um, mm -hmm. and a question about kind of where you started at the very beginning of your talk when you were talking about whether utopia is a genre or a mode or a, you know, mm -hmm. a, a psyche or, or any one of these number of things, because in order to, to actually tell a story of utopia, there has to be a beginning, there has to be a middle, there has to be an end. And in many ways, that is completely antithetical to what a utopia is. So, you know, novels always bring in an outsider and sometimes the outsider like fucks everything up and sometimes the outsider right. leaves and like there ha there has to be this kind of interruption or this disruption or or you know that outsider maybe has a beginning a middle and an end but the actual utopian society doesn't so in some ways i guess this is like a very vague abstract question about like 
how you actually narrate utopia. <laughs> yeah, that's not vague or abstract at all. That is like, um, that's the crux of it, right? It's like, this is, I mean, utopian novels, as, as I said before, uh, earlier to Renee, um, utopian novels are kind of famously boring. So more, I, Morris, I hopefully the exception News from Nowhere is actually, I think an interesting book. Um, but, you know, they're like basically, cat like they're often don't really have much of a narrative, right? They're often just catalogs of, especially going back to more, right? The, the generic convention is if there's a, somebody shows up and then somebody who lives there describes everything to them, right? <laughs> like that's the novel. Um, because, right, you need conflict in order to have a narrative. You need, um, you need something disruptive. You need something to happen. And so what do you do if you're living in a perfect society? So, yeah, they're often like not really novels in the same way. So that's part of the, the, the generic problem of, of utopia to begin with. But I think like even, even beyond that, the question of kind of, you know, if we think of a, a narrative arc or a traditional narrative structure needing to have a beginning, a middle and an end, and that end is often you know beyond the horizon of the novel itself. It's like, you know, and then they live happily ever after, or we picture there being some kind of futurity that, that um, that carries on from the moment of closure of the novel. Um, I think even you, even like the most utopian utopian novel. So like Ursula K. Le Guin's *The Dispossessed*, which is about an anarchic, you know, uh, society on a planet that's like a there's a there's a planet that's just like Earth. In in this in this world that she imagines, um, human beings have colonized a, a few other planets in the same solar system or not not solar system same galaxy and um and and some anarchists have have split off from the main planet and gone to to start this ideal anarchic society and the the plot is that one of those people goes to the back to the main planet which has been again off limits because it's a planet of great decadence and it's like all the anarchists who are living very poor in a very poor conditions but they're happy because it's an egalitarian society, um, are afraid of being kind of corrupted in a way. But anyway, the point is that like, when you read that novel, there's even like, even Le Guin is like, well, there, you know, there's like just this weird little moments. And, and she does think this is ideal. She's an anarchist, right? So she's like, this is her ideal social organization. But there are these little moments where individual characters are like, you know, this one character is sent to an insane asylum at one point, And it's kind of like this weird throwaway moment. You're like, what like is, that, like is this repressive like so there's even these little tiny suggestions that maybe that society is also kind of op oppressive or repressive or what does that even mean how much oppression or repression uh are we to tolerate in order to have utopia um you know this goes back to the Marcuse thing which i think is his heuristic is so interesting and helpful it's like you know there's a certain amount of repression that is that is necessary and then everything beyond that is the surplus and you know in different different societies tolerate different kinds of, of surplus repression in different ways so anyway um yeah so that was a, off on a tangent but yeah i think this is all tied up with the question of like narratability in order to have a utopian novel is not the same thing as a utopian community right like in order to have a novel we need to have something bad happen do we you know, do we have to have something that happened to our community? Not necessarily, but then we're not necessarily going to be able to narrate it either. So, yeah, all these questions of like, you know, the connection between literature and life, I think, becomes super interesting. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I think you're muted. Oh, you're hi. Okay. Hi. 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 Um, I have a question. I have two thoughts. One was about which I, I I thought Renee's question was really great, as have all of them been. But one of the things I've been thinking about is that utopia uh, starts with an intention. And it's an intention that someone sets out, sets forth. It's an idea. It's a framework. Mm -hmm. And even if you would say the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden was an intention. It was it was a framework that God that God created um, to tell his story or her story or their story. And and that every utopia, as as you've documented them and, and talked about them, are about a set of intentions that a certain group or individual 
or spirit uh, spirit leader uh, suggests is utopia. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then you have the question, as you talked about just now in that back and forth, about conflict with that intention mm -hmm. and, and how that exists or how it doesn't exist. You could even argue perhaps that um, in the rebuilding of Germany in the 1930s, after such incredible disarray, there was a certain group of people who set out an intention for what they thought would be a utopia. Mm -hmm. And that, and that as they began, and they aspire, and that would be, and the other point I would probably have is, and then there needs to be some aspiration. Mm -hmm. There needs to be an aspiration toward an intention. And you know, I think there are so many, we, we talked in our little breakout group about how so many utopias are so different because there are so many different ideas about what utopia is or was or should be. Uh, uh, arguably, there are always going to be, there is always going to be disarray about the, that intention and its fulfillment or its destruction. Um, and so I, I, I guess, I guess, the idea of utopia seems to be much better than the utopian framework that are presented themselves because they're always about a specific practical intention that it cannot satisfy human, human life. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I guess I would respond just to play devil's advocate. I would respond by going back to that question of what is human nature, right? I mean, the, the formulation of that question is always going to be from within the perspective of the society, or, you know, the culture and society, et cetera, um, that the person is asking it. So, uh, and that's why I think that Marcuse is so interesting, right? Is he, he is, he's acknowledging, yeah, we want to do this. We've got to actually change human nature. We've got to, we've got to think about uh, fundamental ways of, of doing this, right? Changing um, human nature, excuse me, changing, we've got to change human nature. I, I'd like the paper on that so we could figure out what, how, to, how to change human nature. I mean, do you really think that's re a reasonable? But, but this, is what I'm, this is what I'm trying to say. Like, we need to think about what we mean by the phrase human nature, right? Mm -hmm. Like, when we, when we just assume all, all human beings, I'm, I'm just using some examples here, right? Because these are common examples that come up when people say that we can't form utopian communities, or whatever. All human beings are inherently jealous. All human beings are inherently envious of each other's possessions. All human beings are in inherently violent. All human, whatever. These are all ideas that we have about human nature that we've internalized because of the places that we come from, right? Um, and so, I mean, I think the extreme version of this, right, would be something like, and this is a novel I've actually taught a couple of times, and this is a super interesting book to, to, to teach, would be Walden 2, which I- the Oh, which I, I love. I love Walden yeah. 2. Well, that's interesting because, <laughs> because of course, Skinner's answer to, um, to, to human nature is to simply, uh, you know, create everything through operant conditioning, right? That we like actually turn people into more. So, I mean, that, that, that's one end of the spectrum, right? And, and it's such an interesting book to read because again, it's one of these books where you're like, does he mean, that? is this, is this a satire or is this, no, it's, it's not. And we know it's not because of the, the context in which he wrote it in his own work, but um, that would be one set of solutions to this problem, right? Is that you, you create the human that you want, right? By, by, you know, the society replicates itself by creating the kind of human beings that are fitted for that society. Now, you could argue that that's already what's happening all the time anyway, right? I mean, you know, a Marxist theorist would, would say that late capitalism is producing the, the citizens it, it wants and needs to perpetuate itself through the operations of late capitalism, right? So it's, I think, the, if the point of utopia is like a really huge imaginative leap, right? That all, we can only sort of approximate that. Like we can only start kind of pushing our way and edging our way toward that. And like, you know, this is just the beginning of a series of conversations, but I think the central question really has to be what, what our, not what is human nature, but what are our internalized ideas of what human nature is and where did they come from? Um, why do we have, why do we think that human beings are inherently jealous of each other? Or, you know, are these qualities that are for durable or are they, you know, I mean, Skinner didn't think so. He thought you could 
reward and and punish people right out of those <laughs> right out of those predilections right so and and, and I, I really look forward to the next two sessions as well and i'll just leave <laughs> i'll leave this one question though why mm -hmm. is it that all of the writing both in pay and i'll say public writing not necessarily academic writing one and i and i'm not a I, I, I'm not conversant with all the academic writing, not even for a second, but why is all the public writing and all the public uh, material on the screen then in the last decade or so been dystopian instead of utopian? Mm -hmm. Why mm -hmm. has all of the popular literature not, no long, there's no longer aspirational idea. There's no longer the aspirational idea of hope and, and part of the, the, the notion of where we expect to be, it is all, I mean, Netflix could be the channel of dystopia, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, in terms, in terms of the material that's there. And I'm gonna say, that's one of the questions I'd like to explore myself in our next couple of sessions as well, as we go along mm -hmm. with news from nowhere. Well, you'll have a great chance to do that in the second session in particular, because that's when we're gonna be reading um, some excerpts from half Earth Socialism, uh, I mean, my quick, very quick answer, and I know we're a minute over time, so I'll just say very quickly, that's really changing just in the past few years. Like that's what I think is so interesting. A bunch of stuff is coming out, a lot of books and a lot of imaginative literature too, that it, it feels like we're right at the edge of a kind of a utopian revival. So oh, well, well, I, 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 I might say a switch because we often go from one extreme to the other mm -hmm. because the new extreme feels fresh from what we've been living in, but our, I look forward to well, it. Well, yeah, I would say it's, it feels necessary too. That would, <laughs> that would be my particular feeling about it. But we'll have plenty of chance to talk about that some more. So, and, and Morris has a lot to teach us about that too and, and uh, his perspective. So, great. Yeah. Thank great. you. Well, Thank you all so much. I see there's some questions in the chat too. I guess I'm, I can, I didn't get a chance to look at them, but I can just download them and, right. Yeah, so maybe, I mean, maybe one okay. question. Um, Courtney's question is maybe a, a maybe a place that we can um, we can start uh, next time when she asks if it's possible to create a utopia that one can mm. opt into or out of. I feel like that's mm -hmm. maybe an interesting interesting mm -hmm. question to think about in, in relationship yeah. to from nowhere. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, that is a that's a great that would be a great starting point um, place for next time. So, um, so I guess for next time we're doing chapters one through twenty, right? And then um, I, I I'll need to figure out how to get you a PDF of just a short excerpt from Half of Her Socialism for the for the third one. But I guess I can just send it to you, Courtney, and you can distribute it. Great, awesome. Yeah, so absolutely uh, great. I will see you all about in about a month, I guess. Right? Yes. Thank you great. so much, Dee. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thinking. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks we for are coming. looking forward to next time. Okay, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody.